Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Hoover Virtual Policy Briefing. I'm Tom Gilligan, and I'm the director of the Hoover Institution. The Hoover Institution is one of the nation's preeminent research centers dedicated to generating policy ideas that promote economic prosperity, national security, and democratic governance. Throughout our 100-year history, our work has directly led to policies that have produced greater freedom, democracy, and opportunity in the United States and around the world. In the face of this worldwide pandemic, we will be bringing you regular online briefings from Hoover Scholars. I want to remind everybody that we will be taking audience questions today, which you can submit uh, at the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Today's briefing is from Dr. Scott Atlas, who is the David and Joan Traytel Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution. Before coming to Hoover full time, Scott had a 25 year career in tertiary care medicine at the top medical centers in the country and served as chief of neuroradiology at the Stanford University Medical Center for 14 years. Scott researches the role of government and the private sector in access, quality, and pricing of healthcare. He advises leaders in government and the private sector and has served as senior advisor in health policy for several presidential candidates, members of Congress, and key administration officials. Scott also frequently testifies before Congress on healthcare policy. His most recent book is entitled Restoring Quality Healthcare, a Six-Point Plan for Comprehensive Reform at Lower Cost. Scott, thank you for joining us today. Sure, happy to be here, Tom. Great. Uh, just a general question to get us off uh, started. In, in the face of the growing pandemic, uh, we're inundated with statistics on everything from new cases to deaths to worldwide totals and a growing uh, uh, spread of the virus. Can you help explain these numbers for us? Yeah, I, that, that's a very important question. Uh, we're, we're inundated with numbers and including numbers that uh, are spoken with a lot of uh, worst case scenario projections and frankly, hyperbole. I think we have to be very careful about looking at those numbers and understand their basis. I mean, the first big number was the original mortality figure that is frequently cited of between three and 4% of infected patients. And, and that number really was a distortion, an overestimate by far as it's being analyzed now, uh, because it was based on the people who were uh, severely sick or very sick and seeking medical attention and defining that as the total number of people infected. When we know from other data that is much better, for instance, the data on the ship that, uh, that was the original source of, of many of the uh, infections, uh, where we had a confined population and everyone that was tested uh, with a mortality of about 1%, to other more detailed studies uh, by Stanford Medical School, Stanford Epidemiology, uh, universities in England, a, a study from France, Florida, in conjunction with the CDC. The reality is that the, the number of the fatality rate will be highly likely to be far under 1% and possibly in order of magnitude less than that. Even uh, approaching the sort of numbers that uh, are, are dealt with in the flu. I think we have to be very, very careful of interpreting the numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, the second uh, big part is that the, what, what numbers should we be looking at as, as people looking and trying to assess what's happening? I think the number of new cases per day is extremely misleading. And it's still being uh, talked about in the media as a critical number and oh my God, things are exploding. But the reality is that we're going to get more numbers of cases if a case is defined, which it is being defined like a positive test. Mm -hmm. Because the more testing we do, the more, uh, you know, the more cases we'll see. And so what number should we be looking at? It's the number of new deaths per day. When we look at the number of new deaths per day, country by country, and I'm talking about no matter what country you're looking at, although I'm excluding China because I'm not sure of the veracity of their numbers. We look at countries, uh, even Italy, we see sort of a rough idea that the number of, uh, that first of all, the policies of isolating and self-quarantining and avoiding group activities are working. That's very important to know. And, how, and we look at the number of new cases per day, and it's probably peaking at three to four weeks. 
And this is seeming to be uh, consistent uh, around countries all over the world. I think that's a much better number. The number of new cases per day is sort of, uh, depends on how you define a case and the more testing, the more cases. Uh, you know, the other thing is that, you know, a lot of the case projections and the disastrous projections, projections are already being revised. Just days ago, a very uh, famous projection was that 500,000 people were going to die in the UK. The same people are projecting 20,000 people. Now that's not a trivial number, but I think you have to take with a grain of salt who is saying what. There's one other important point if I can go on about the numbers. There's some perspective here. I'm looking at the numbers from today and in the United States, there have been 1,000 deaths, which is, it's not trivial. I'm not trying to minimize that. 1,000 deaths from COVID-19 in the United States as a country. Every year, the conventional flu, 30 to 60,000 people in the U.S. die every flu season, mm -hmm. okay? In the world, 600, 650,000 people die from conventional flu COVID deaths so far, 22,000. I think we have to have some perspective here uh, and, and control the panic because the spread of the panic is harmful. It's creating shortages that are unnecessary, including on things like, uh, like masks. And I'll talk about that if you'd like. Yeah. Hey, Scott, you, you know, for, for some more general perspective, could you give us your perspective on how we're doing at containing the coronavirus? Yeah, I, uh, I'd be happy to. I, I think the, the basic uh, bottom line is we're doing pretty well. We know from other countries, including the hardest hit countries, that these sorts of avoiding group, large group uh, activities, uh, self-isolating if you're sick, eliminating or restricting visits to the vulnerable population, the only people really who die, the elderly, and particularly elderly with chronic diseases. We know these policies work in other countries and we are doing them. And I think uh, our numbers are, are probably uh, going, you know, it's, it's early. I, I can't, I'm not predicting uh, with a lot of accuracy necessarily, but I think that all reasonable numbers point to the fact that our number of severe outcomes will be peaking around uh, three weeks or so. And I think these, these policies are working. Got it, thank you. Uh, for those of you who are just tuning in, I'm Tom Gilligan of the Hoover Institution and today's uh, virtual policy uh, briefing speaker is Dr. Scott Atlas. Uh, Scott, there's a robust debate in our country about how to balance the economic concerns with health policy issues. What, how should we be thinking about that going forward? What kind of policies should we implement to try to uh, respect both our livelihood and protecting the lives of Americans? Yeah, I, I think that's a, that's a great question, and that's sort of what's uh, already coming out of the administration and many uh, things that are being written. And I think uh, this is critical, not just for the economic uh, sort of uh, health and survival of people in the country. It's also important on a biology related uh, way to understand what's happening because this whole population isolation is not just economically problematic, it's biologically problematic because there are fundamental principles of biology that you'd have to understand. And the biggest one, this is a very good piece, by the way, written in the New York Times by Dr. David Katz about four days ago, who's the uh, director of Yale's Disease Prevention Center, who uh, wrote a, a, a fantastic piece outlining uh, the strategy given the goals, okay? The goals here are clear. That is to save lives, to avoid unnecessarily overwhelming the medical system. And I say unnecessarily overwhelming the medical system because when you do that, you actually kill people and endanger people, they actually need medical care. Remember, it's probably true that 99% of people or more that are positive COVID-19 don't need any medical care. And this is very critical to understand. And then the other thing is to allow biological immunity to develop. That's how virus infections are typically eradicated. It's a big part of it. It's a combination of vaccination and natural human immunity. If you shelter everyone in place and avoid all human contact as an extreme, you cannot develop population immunity. 
given the fact that the overwhelming majority of people who get COVID infection are either asymptomatic or mild symptoms or but don't need hospitalization, that is how the population develops immunity, ultimately controls the spread, and eradicates the virus. So I think these are really critical. Now, what, what I've been advising the administration on, and, and others have done this too, is really a, a three things. Number one, make sure it's publicly known that people that are young and otherwise healthy and sick do not go to the hospital. Of course, if you're experiencing shortness of breath and worsening, call your doctor, and I'm not anyone's doctor out there, uh, but I, I think the, the, the idea that you would overwhelm the medical system is harmful for people who don't need medical care. The second part of the strategy is to do a more strategic, focused quarantine isolation policy not whole population. As I mentioned, there are reasons not to do it. So what do I mean by that? I mean restricting visitations to nursing care centers and the vulnerable. We want to protect the people who are going to die from this. And that means making sure those people who are taking care of nursing care uh, residents are tested. Uh, but isolating people, self-quarantine, and this is a public education thing, who are sick and everyone in their family, if you're exposed, okay, you're, you're isolating yourself, but that doesn't mean total lockdown of every business. In fact, we look at the countries like Japan, South Korea, and other countries like the Netherlands who are, did not totally lock down their, uh, their economies. And then the third part is the testing, which of course is a very hot topic, uh, lots of uh, hand-wringing about this. And it's true that it's important. But the real way to deal with testing is prioritize testing. Who really needs testing urgently? Not everybody. The people that need testing urgently are people that are super sick, that are in ICU type or respiratory distress in hospitals, that's obvious. The people that are elderly with chronic diseases who are sick need testing because they can decompensate. They can get much worse after several days. Uh, the people that are healthcare workers need testing because we don't want obvious infection of sick people. They're dealing with sick people. Therefore, by definition, those people are vulnerable. Whether or not those people have COVID, they have the chronic diseases that are risk factors for dying, like heart failure, kidney failure, diabetes, and most importantly, other lung diseases. So there's a, there's a, a rational strategy that is not just rational on the basis of economic concern. It's important for people to understand medical science, to know that natural human immunity of populations that is sometimes called herd immunity. It's very important that that develops. That's how viruses are eradicated. Scott, are you uh, worried about shortages of ICU beds or respirators or other kind of medical supplies that are needed to fight the virus? Uh, you know, that, that's a very important concern. Uh, again, part of the issue is uh, what we have and what kind of uh, messaging has been given to the public to create what I believe is an exaggerated panic. Uh, we, we, if you look at the numbers in terms of critical care beds, for example, uh, it's true that all countries, including ours, would be overwhelmed if everyone, or if a worst case scenario projection came true. But those projections are, are not really the, the reality. The reality is that our country has two to 10 times the number of ICU and critical care beds, for instance, than any of these other countries that are, are sort of peer nations uh, in Western Europe and Japan have. When you particularly adjust for the vulnerable population, because who will need these respirators in this sort of disease are the older people. So you, you did the, I did the calculations myself, uh, and that's clear that uh, we're in better shape than other countries. Uh, that doesn't mean that we can't be overwhelmed. We could be overwhelmed if the worst case scenarios came through, mm -hmm. uh, but they won't. And the, and the second, uh, we know that from the data. Uh, the second, uh, thing to know, uh, I think it's a, a very important question, is this idea of shortage of masks. It's very important first to take a step back and realize who should have a mask. A mask is designed for two reasons. 
to prevent someone from coughing into your face and infecting you. If you're in a position where you think someone will be coughing into your face, you should wear a mask. And the second thing is to stop people who are coughing infection into other people to stop that infection. The real reason why people in operating rooms and, and when we do medical procedures, we wear a mask is not to avoid getting infected, is to avoid infecting others. So if you're a person who's sick with this, who's coughing, because coughing is a very common symptom, and someone is going to come into your room, you should put a mask on. It's also true that healthcare workers need masks because they are being coughed on. But it's not true. I think it's been grossly exaggerated that somehow everyone should be hoarding masks and wearing masks everywhere they go. And not, this isn't just wrong, it's harmful. Why is it harmful? Because it's part of the reason why there's a shortage of masks for healthcare workers. So I would suggest if anyone is at home with a bunch of masks, they should be, they'd be better off giving those masks to their hospitals. Outstanding. Before we go to audience questions, I want to remind everybody that you're listening to Dr. Scott Atlas, a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution. I also want to uh, invite all of you to go to our website, hoover.org, to uh, obtain more research uh, done by Hoover Fellows on the COVID-19 crisis. Scott, I want to ask one more question before we go to the audience. Yeah. Is what's the status of the drug treatment uh, for COVID-19? Is there a vaccine out there? What's the time horizon that we should expect for med medicine to be able to address this crisis? Yeah, so this is, of course, very, very important to understand. There's, there's two separate things that are important about drugs. One is treating the disease. And then the second topic is vaccines. They're completely different. Uh, vaccines protect you from future disease. Drugs treat the disease. The good news is drugs for treating the disease, uh, I think most people are ex very, very optimistic that this is just around the corner. It's being used in clinical trials. And what do I mean by drugs treating the disease? First is drugs treating people who have severe respiratory distress, ICU type patients, very sick patients. These patients are responding in clinical trials. Uh, the data is preliminary. They're being tested in clinical trials, but there are also anecdotal reports out there to the IV drugs like for instance, the Gilead drug. Now, why was that available? It's in clinical testing now all over the world, including in China, Western Europe, United States. Why is that uh, available so quickly? First of all, the clinical trials are projected to finish uh, within, I would say about three weeks, uh, sometime in April. And uh, the reason they were being able to be used right away is because these are the drugs that were previously proven to be, this drug anyway, was proven to be safe in similar coronavirus pandemics. Those diseases uh, sort of eradicated before they could have complete human clinical testing on this drug. But this drug was proven safe in what's called non-human primates, which basically means monkeys. It was proven safe in humans, so it was ready to go for a uh, very uh, quick uh, clinical trial. These clinical trials are uh, being used all over, we, uh, and I'm highly optimistic because we know they work on these other viruses, and uh, the in vitro, the scientific studies show that they have, this, they, they have the capacity to work on this, and there are anecdotal reports already. Uh, the other drug treatment that people have heard about is this hydroxyl chloroquine, uh, which is the anti-malarial drug with or without something called azithromycin, which is the antibiotic. It's a common antibiotic. And uh, I think people are very optimistic. There have been small studies. They're cautiously optimistic, but, but optimistic that this will work. Uh, it's very important for everyone listening to know that you shouldn't be taking this drug. The drug is not to be taken without a doctor prescription and a doctor uh, supervision because the drug is very toxic at higher doses. It has significant toxicity, side effects, vision loss, heart, severe heart problems. It has drug interactions with other drugs. You should not be taking this drug. No one should be taking this drug to avoid getting COVID-19. No one should be taking this drug for mild symptoms. 
I, I just think that it's, it's very important for the public to know. Uh, there have been problems uh, with some uh, sort of um, the inferences that, that were said, but basically uh, the bottom line is true, is that it's people are optimistic. The studies have not been completed. You can't just give somebody a group of patients the drug and they get better and say, oh, it works. There's scientific studies that have to be done, meaning controlled populations with and without the drug. You have to make sure the drug actually works. And I'm highly confident that the right studies are being done and this information will be available soon. Now, vaccines is a separate category, if I can go on. Vaccines take much longer to develop although not nearly as long as the technology 10 to 20 years ago when it was based on growing virus, having biology related limitations in the speed of vaccine development. Now everything is done in a molecular biology process of taking a piece of what's called RNA, genetic information. Uh, we know this from the coding that was done on the original virus and from the antibodies that were generated in patients who survived. And there are companies out there rapidly working. There are dozens of companies working on vaccines. There is technology that should be able to produce anywhere from tens of thousands to millions of doses in short order. The data preliminarily looks good. The processes are underway, but it's going to be, I, I think most people would say it's gonna be at least nine months for that to happen. Right. Hey, Scott, Richard asked the following question. What makes New York City such an epicenter for COVID-19? Uh, will the Bay Area and other uh, highly populated, densely populated areas like Chicago face similar circumstances? Why or why not? Yeah, I mean, that, that's a very good question. Uh, I mean, there's, you know, and of course, there's not everything known to answer the question, but we can make some natural sort of assumptions here about why New York uh, number one, there's a tremendous density of the population, particularly in Manhattan, uh, the living pro uh, quarter, the proximity of everybody, the crowds, the lines uh, at every public gathering. It's very different from everywhere else in the United States, including very different from cities like San Francisco. Uh, secondly, there are, there are a lot of flights that go into New York from international settings, and we know that is the, the epicenter, the original a focus of the disease was in China and those flights and stopping those flights from China actually was a very important move, uh, but including places like Italy and other countries and uh, other cities or, or countries uh, that had a lot of cases, they go to New York. So there was a natural inflow that didn't uh, get imported into other parts of the United States. I think it's uh, probably incorrect to make the statement that New York is the canary in the coal mine and every other city will have that profile, every other state will have that profile. I, I think that's probably incorrect. When you look at the numbers, uh, again, you can see from everywhere that there's sort of a plateauing nationally, a peaking of say three weeks or so in the number of deaths. You have to be very careful interpreting the number of cases because the more testing we do, the more cases will be detected even people that have no significant morbidity or bad outcome from the disease, including asymptomatic people. So I, I think uh, to extrapolate from that uh, is sort of a worst case scenario that is probably gonna turn out to be incorrect. In fact, some of the original projections have already been revised uh, about number of deaths and number of cases dramatically revised in days. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Uh, Adrivet asks the following question, has the recent outbreak highlighted any structural flaws in our current healthcare system and, and how should we think, if at all, about any changes that need to be made to the system going forward, maybe to confront future pandemics? Sure. I mean, I think preparation, uh, I think we can make a couple of statements. One, pandemics are going to keep happening. We know this from the new sort of globalization that occurs in, in, the, in the last 10 10 years or more, 20 years. Uh, it's a natural setup. And also we know that this is the third one since 2003. So it's going to happen again. And the key is how to prepare for that. I think structurally, uh, you know, the, the data shows that our system is sort of better off than anywhere else, uh, certainly in terms of looking at facts. And those facts include 
availability of ICU beds per capita, per capita vulnerable population, uh, availability of specialist doctors, rapid access to drugs. And we know this sort of works because we have the best outcomes in every other life-threatening disease, whether it's stroke, heart attacks, cancer, and ICU-related respiratory related deaths like this sort of thing compared to other countries. So I think in terms of that, uh, I feel good about it. Now, are we prepared fully for pandemics? No, uh, really no one is and we need to do some work on that. And I would instruct people if they're interested to go look at the Johns Hopkins Health Security website where they did a pandemic uh, sort of simulation exercise and came out with recommendations in 2018, less than two years ago really. And we see what needs to be done. And much of it centers around some of the things I mentioned, which are strategic uh, vaccinations, strategic and rapid, uh, certain resources need to be uh, strategically and rapidly available, et cetera. So yes, preparation can be better. There's no question. Every system will be overwhelmed, no matter what we do, if the worst case scenarios happen, but we can do a better job being prepared. And those uh, sort of efforts are, are now under a significant scrutiny, I can assure you that. Uh, I got a couple questions I'm gonna combine, Scott, that have to do with uh, reactions in other countries around the world. Uh, Mark asked, what is going on in Japan? The country had a number of early cases. The population is not isolated to the same degree that many other countries' populations are, and yet there has not been the same growth in the number of cases or deaths seen as in other hard hit locations, why? And Christopher asked a similar question. People are t talking a lot about Korea's high test rates. Do you know, um, well, I lost the train. I got my, my questions moved. So go there's a question okay. about Korea and, and uh, Japan. And, yes, and these, these are very in, uh, instructive cases. And I think, uh, again, uh, sort of the messaging uh, has been distorted here. These are countries, South Korea and Japan, that did not lock down their economies. They did not totally isolate, but they have different uh, situations. Uh, you know, basically South Korea had a three-pronged approach. They did test to identify hot spots of infection. They did broader testing. Uh, and of course they passed government legislation to give the government authority to monitor and collect all credit card phone data and other data from those who test positive and to show their whereabouts all over social media. Okay, I mean, I, I'm not sure that uh, we have that sort of a societal interest in doing that. Uh, the second thing, they strategically use medical care along the lines of what I'm saying is that they made sure everyone understood that mild symptoms in younger, healthier people need to self quarantine not go into the medical centers, but self-quarantine and strictly isolate themselves. And they needed to do this sort of social distancing stuff that we're doing. And this is similar to what Japan and South Korea both did. Uh, but what, what they did is they had a, a way to verify quarantine. And, and South Korea particularly had a way to punish those. In other words, they had, first of all, verification. People that were self-quarantined were called up twice a day to make sure they were still quarantining themselves. And they passed laws or were proposing laws and have laws that were fining people significant amount of money and, and jail time if you broke the quarantine. So mm -hmm. there's a different culture there, but they did not lock down their economies. And the key to me is that they made verified quarantining of people that were sick and, and made sure they didn't overwhelm their medical system. Got it. Here's a question from Benjamin Scott. Will the coming warmer weather in the U.S. and Europe help reduce the severity of COVID-19 outbreak uh, like it tends to do for the normal flu? Yeah, I mean, this is a question that I think uh, we're hoping that's true. Uh, many of these viruses have seasonal uh, durations. The reasons, uh, first of all, we don't know the answer definitely. I want to make that clear about this virus. The second part is that we really don't fully understand why that happens. Some of these other viruses uh, are transmitted via direct droplet contamination, like someone coughing or sneezing or shaking your hand after they did that. Others are more easily transmitted on surfaces, uh, 
uh, they stay for a certain number of days. It, it's very difficult to say if the temperature or if the proximity of people in living in winter versus outdoors in the summer uh, change the in, uh, contagiousness of flu and the transmissibility. So a lot of the information isn't known. Uh, I think we see these latitude differences, these temperate zones, uh, various climate bands, but, but a lot of the information is, is not fully understood even for the flu. We hope that's true. It's happened in the past. My guess and, and the guesses of Fauci and Dr. Burks and others that I've listened to are that this too will be sort of a seasonal pattern, but it's not 100% known yet. Yeah, I'm going to combine a couple questions here, uh, Scott, to kind of give you the big picture question. And Tom asked, do you have a recommendation as to when we can start opening America for business, knowing that some areas will need to stay under stricter restrictions than others? And Jim asked a really interesting question, and it's the following. In a pandemic, should health experts be the ones conveying the facts and recommended policies versus politicians offering non-scientific messages? How, how do we reconcile public health concerns versus the country's need, uh, country's economic health? Yeah, the second one, uh, it's, it's clear, in my opinion, I agree with the sort of uh, thrust of that question, which is who should be speaking. I think we have leaders and leadership positions, including our government leaders that need to speak. They need to have, uh, their voice heard. Uh, and I think we as Americans and other countries look to our political leaders uh, for general direction. I also think it's very dangerous when people with layman knowledge, and that's not just talking about government officials, it's talking about other people, layman medical knowledge, political scientists, economists, all kinds of people who are very smart and accomplished in their areas they need to stop pontificating about things like medical issues, about testing and isolation. There's a lot of misinformation. And so I think that there's a combination of leadership role and deferring to people like, for instance, uh, we see Dr. Burks on TV, the person who's the head of the task force, and I think she's, she's absolutely outstanding. Uh, this, the first part, the first question that you asked was when can America and other countries re-enter toward normal life? Uh, you know, there's no clear 100% answer to this yet, uh, but when we look at the number of new deaths per day, which I think is the best uh, way to gauge what's happening, we see sort of this general pattern that I hope continues that is stay after three to four weeks, there is a decline in the number of new deaths per day. Uh, and given that other countries, not just Japan and South Korea, but countries like the Netherlands, they did not do complete lockdown. Uh, they did this strategic isolation and uh, it's important to obey it, uh, but they didn't lock down every business and they did suggest that we need to isolate the elderly and work from home if possible. Uh, these countries uh, did well. Our mitigation work will work. I am, I am certain of that. We will not reach these uh, projections that were first uh, instilled into the media. And uh, I think it's gonna be weeks, uh, short number of weeks, not months, where we get a gradual re-entry. Now there is also sort of a who's in charge uh, phenomenon here because we know this in the US, uh, governors uh, have a significant and perhaps the dominant say in how things are going. It's not a federal edict that things need to reopen, even if it was made. And so, uh, although, I mean, we do see Governor Cuomo this morning, I was told, uh, started to uh, talk about how we need to gradually re-enter and just uh, really be strategic in who's isolated and what's shut down, like group activities, et cetera. Great. I want to remind everybody we're listening to Dr. Scott Atlas on the COVID-19 crisis. Also, I want to tell everybody we have about 15 more minutes of today's briefing. Please submit your questions at the bottom of your screen. Uh, Scott, here's an interesting question from Teresa. Uh, is, it, is it known yet whether someone who had COVID-19 develops immunity 
and will not become reinfected? And I guess it's a broader question about the formation of antibodies and, and maybe antibodies as a tool to confront this. Could you talk a bit more about that? Sure, uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great question. Uh, a, it's, it's not known exactly, uh, it is known that people develop antibodies. It's not known how long immune resistance uh, will persist in this infection. That's not known yet. Uh, it is inferred from previous coronavirus literature. When you look at the scientific literature, coronaviruses have been around for decades. This is not the family of viruses called coronaviruses is not brand new. We look at the virology textbooks from 50 years ago. Uh, they cite data Every infection, every virus elicits a different duration of being immune to that virus. And that is also true for vaccines. Some vaccinations last for your whole lifetime. Others have to be redone. We know the flu vaccine, although it's a different mix every year. Uh, the, the vaccinations from these respiratory infections in general, including coronaviruses that aren't so destructive, other coronaviruses that cause typically mild infections, have immunities that last on the order of 12 months. That's the basic family of virus literature. Uh, we don't know this virus specifically, how long immunity will last. We do know a couple of other things that are sort of interesting and important to understand. When you get a flu shot, the immunity begins within two weeks. It takes days, it's not instant, that you're immune to the flu after you get your flu shot your body generates immunity, antibodies, and it takes two weeks. Uh, the second thing is we don't know 100% yet if this virus changes every time it appears or has a propensity to rapidly change. There is some preliminary uh, thought that it doesn't change dramatically, rapidly. And in fact, that's uh, sort of borne out if you take the view that if you look at how effective the drugs that were developed for other coronaviruses are working, at least preliminarily, in this coronavirus, we know that that active part of the virus hasn't changed. And that's where we want to direct treatment as well as vaccination. So I think that's good news. Uh, we don't know how long the immunity will last yet. And uh, then the last part of the question, I think, is how quickly can we develop vaccines? Vaccines are, are, are a little bit uh, trickier, as I, I think I may have mentioned already, but it's going to be several months and hopefully, but not necessarily uh, completely before the next season, if there is a next season. There's a lot of unknown yet. Yeah. Hey, Scott, we talked about this earlier. Uh production of vaccines and medicine for viruses like this depend at some level on the, on the nature of international cooperation um, in the medical community. Could you give us your assessment of whether that's good, bad, or whether we should do something different? No, I, I think that that's true. That, uh, and there is a tremendous amount of cooperation among academics, uh, facilities who are involved greatly in the research, among uh, governments, among uh, even uh, other scientists. Uh, but there's also a positive about a lot of different independent drugs and vaccines being developed. We, we need mm. to know a couple things. Number one, uh, we don't have a specific single way that this is going to be treated. There are many options and many have, uh, have good you know, preliminary data. Uh, that means including uh, some of the IV uh, things that I mentioned that directly attack the virus. There are plasma exchanges of antibodies that have some very good potential uh, role in this, et cetera. We want multiple different types of drugs to be worked on independently. We don't want to buy into one avenue of treatment. And the same thing for vaccines. By the way, there are over 50 uh, drugs being worked on in clinical trials already, over 50, and there are dozens, probably over 40 vaccines in trials at various stages already being worked on. And some of the manufacturers of vaccines have already uh, given out numbers that they can develop up to millions of doses uh, within the next year. Oh, amazing. Good news. Uh, Scott, here's a question from India. Chiranton asked, what about a second wave, Scott? Do you foresee IPR battles 
in drug vaccine solutions creating access issues? Also, what yeah. should a country like India do? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a great question, uh, particularly relevant because India is a supplier of many of these drugs, including the hydroxyl chloroquine, although many different countries make it and supply it. India is one of the big ones and they just put in a ban, <clears throat> if I read correctly, the government banned export from India of hydroxyl chloroquine <clears throat> because they want to keep it for their own population. Uh, so th there will be issues like this. I think uh, it's a tricky area. Uh, we know that the US, uh, the data has come out, at least more visible, that roughly 70 or 80% of the active ingredients of our drugs are made outside the US, particularly China and India. And uh, some people have said, well, why don't we just shift to India because we're uh, sort of a more trusted ally there. Uh, the problem is that India gets 70% of their active ingredients from China uh, because they're, they're 30 to 40% cheaper from China than from India. So, you know, money is, is, has been a relevant factor here. That said, there is a heightening of awareness of not just the biological dependence, but it's really a national security issue. Uh, so I think this is all being re-looked at. Most pharmaceutical companies do not have a single supply chain. Mm -hmm. That is not the way companies are run. I think people have to be aware of that as a general statement. Vis-a-vis uh, -vis China and this national security issue that's uh, being put forth right now, uh, there's a couple other things to remember. China is highly dependent on our drugs. China has a massive uh, expansion of cancer cases, for instance, with half the survival rate of the United States in the literature, and they import their cancer drugs. In fact, the, the sort of trade tariff agreements excluded from China's tariffs on our stuff, they explicitly excluded cancer drugs. Uh, there, there's a bi-directional dependence uh, and that includes, uh, I think, India also. So I think there will be very tricky issues here uh, and it heightens the need for your own concerns about your own sort of national security. Every country has concerns about national security. Uh, and uh, this, this is a big issue that will under, undergo quite a bit of scrutiny and reallocation of resources, I am sure. Yeah. Hey, Scott, let's pick out one of the worst cases, like uh, Italy. W what happened there? Why did the virus spread so quickly? That's a question from Micah. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a great question. Uh, and of course, we can't be 100% certain, but there are, there are some factors that are clear. Number one, uh, they have a tremendous number of uh, workers and uh, visitors from China and they had that, and particularly in the northern part of Italy, which is uh, the Milan area, uh, centered around fashion, uh, hundreds of thousands of workers. Uh, there are people that uh, had a much far uh, more frequent uh, voyage from, from the areas of the original virus contamination into Italy. Uh, Italy originally did not do any isolation whatsoever, any quarantining whatsoever. And uh, that, that didn't work out very well. Uh, so that's a problem. Their medical system was overwhelmed. Uh, it's not the United States uh, medical system. So that, that was a problem. Culturally, it's very different. Uh, and demographically, it's different. Demographically, it has the largest or one of the largest populations of elderly compared to all their neighbors, even in Western Europe. And the elderly are the vulnerable. And, and that's not just the vulnerable to die. It's also statistically the vulnerable to even get infected. If you look at the data from the cruise ship, uh, most of the people that died, uh, most of the people on the ship were old, 60% were over 60. 75% of the people who got positive on testing, whether symptomatic or not, 75% were over 60. So there's a predilection to get infected, not just die if you're older, and Italy is older. And then culturally, uh, it's, it's a very sort of, a, I'll just say a warm culture with a lot of uh, proximity in customs. 
And I think it took them a while to understand that they must do some uh, explicit uh, quarantining of people who are sick. And it got out of control. But if you look at their numbers right now, it looks like uh, there has been a peaking of the number of deaths per day. And that's how you have to assess it. That's the best way to assess the, the, uh, the progress of the disease, in my opinion. Got it. Great. Scott, we've reached the end of our briefing today. Uh, really appreciate your comments. Do you care to conclude with any ideas or thoughts? Yeah, well, I think that a couple things, uh, just to highlight some things I said. Number one, be, be, be uh, careful about who you're listening to because, you know, the spread of the fear has become a huge problem. And a lot of that fear was unnecessary and uh, it was exaggerated from the numbers and even those prognostications have been dramatically revised downward uh, without minimizing really the seriousness of the situation. The second point I wanna make and emphasize is that do not take hydroxyl chloroquine uh, without it being under a doctor's direction and for the right reasons. I, I think I, I can't highlight that uh, too much. Uh, and then the third thing is, you know, a lot of the hoarding and panic, I think is harmful uh, to the function of society and is actually limiting important things like masks in hospitals. I think you really have to use some common sense here uh, and, and listen to the precise words of the people who actually know. Great. Thanks Thank very much, Scott. I want to remind everybody in the audience that Scott uh, published an editorial in the Washington Times today on this subject. I invite everybody to go read it. Um, you can see it also on our hoover.org website uh, under the Hoover Daily Briefing tab. I also want to invite all of you to attend our next virtual briefing, which will be on Tuesday, March 31st at 11 a.m. Pacific and 2 p.m. Eastern. It will feature Neil Ferguson. Neil is the Milbank Family Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution and author of 15 books, including his most recent, The Square and the Tower. He's an award he's award-winning filmmaker, having won an international Emmy for his PBS series, The Ascent of Money. You can join Tuesday's briefing at the same link you signed in on today. To find more on the coronavirus by, by Hoover Institution Fellows, go to our website, hoover.org, where there's an entire section on the COVID-19 issue. I want to thank you all for attending today, and I want to wish you all the health and safety going forward. I hope to see you next week. Bye-bye.